Hello and welcome once again to the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. My name is Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post. Fisherman's Post, which has been serving the fishing community since 2003, bringing you fishing reports, fishing news, fishing tournaments, fishing schools, and now our latest chapter of serving the fishing community, the Saltwater Podcast Series. And in this Saltwater Podcast Series, we reach out to our friends, our captain and guide friends from up and down the North Carolina coast and ask them to share with us their insights on how to catch more fish more often. And in doing so, in trying to empower you all to catch more fish more often, what we're really truly trying to do is just to get you to spend more time with more family and friends, more time on the water. Um, in this particular episode, we're going to be talking near shore bottom fishing in the summertime, so specifically in the summertime, near shore bottom fishing. And my guest this week is Captain Trevor Smith of Proficiency Charters, that's Profish NC, Proficiency Charters, working out of Wrightsville Beach and the surrounding areas. And we're gonna be covering such topics as how far offshore to go, contour lines versus ARs, jigs and hooks and bait options, and then ultimately implementation. So we've got a good show for you today. Looking forward to talking to Trevor. Before we get to Trevor, I'd like to introduce you to my co-host, sitting with me every, every episode, every podcast, Billy Thorpe of Thorpe Creative. Welcome once again to a new episode, Billy. What's up, Gary? Good to see you, man. Yeah, man. Looking it is good, good. dude. It's been a hot one out there. I'm all hot and sweaty over here. <laughs> I don't know why I said over that. Over there. Over, over there. <laughs> Man, what's been happening, Gary? You been doing good, man? Yeah, it has been hot, but that's all right, man. I'm uh, I'm excited to talk fishing. I'm excited to go fishing, but right now... It's all about the talk. Let's talk fishing. All right, let's do. But before we do, I'm going to talk about how to watch, how to listen, and I will bring up this slide. If you're watching, you can see this. You can check us out on Spotify, Podbean, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Google Play Music, and the easiest way, Gary, is for people to go right to our website, fishermanspost.com, click on the podcast tab, and you can watch or listen from there. So that's the easiest way to do it. Um, and these podcasts are made possible by... This particular one is made possible by Marine Warehouse Center. And so I got a quick video from those guys. We'll be right back. Right on. Marine Warehouse, we have everything. We have new boats. We have parts. We have accessories, new trailers. We have a complete service department with highly trained technicians. Anything you need to get out on the water, we have. At Marine Warehouse Center, as we've grown over the last few years, now have a large section of marine supplies from start to finish for all your boating needs. What I love about this region is to be able to get out on the water, and also we love to be able to get you out on the water. The best part of working at Marine Warehouse is being able to get involved with the customers and share a love for the water. Boom, right there you go, Gary. Great Every, crew there. Everything you need. Everything you need. Sales, service, parts. You get your boat service there. I do. Mostly. Yes, yeah. I do. I get my boat service there. Your imaginary boat that you I hope do. someone <laughs> gifts to the podcast. I'm glad, I'm glad you caught on, man. This is perfect. <laughs> well, I, Billy, I've started a new angle with Marine Warehouse Center. All right. While they do offer everything, you know, it's often the team behind the team that keeps the machine moving. Marine Warehouse has a great team. I've introduced you to a couple of players. I'm going to introduce you to a new player today. All right. Stop by today. Lauren Garvey. Lauren Garvey is the sales administrator. All right. So here's the deal with Lauren. For this is what I hear from hanging out at the <laughs> Marine Warehouse yard. She works hard. What usually follows? You work hard, you... You play hard. You play hard. All right. So she works hard, man. She processes paperwork like no other. She'll take care of you. She'll move it through. You'll have a new boat. But she likes to play hard. She's been a little bit sad. Oh, that stinks. Because Red Dogs has been closed because of COVID. So rumor has mm -hmm. it, and I hate to participate in rumor, but <laughs> clearly I don't <laughs> I hate don't, it that much because I'm. I don't know. Cause this is where it's going. <laughs> Marine Warehouse rumor has it. Lauren's been spotted several times hanging outside of Red Dogs. <laughs> Dancing in the streets, <laughs> waiting for someone to open that door and let her back in. Please let this be true. Please. I love it. Unconfirmed rumor. You'll have to decide. Uh, I'm going to go ask her. 
I'm not going to decide. I'm going to go ask you. <laughs> you should. Or go to Red Dogs. <laughs> or should be commenting on this vi- on this YouTube video. <laughs> that would be great if, w- if that were to happen. Hey, show oh, me a fish man. photo. Here we go. Fish photo. This is a good one, too, man. This is Blake Crumpler from Rocky Mount, North Carolina. He caught and released this uh, nine-pound American red snapper about 25 miles off the coast here, Wrightsville Beach, uh, fishing with a cut ballyhoo. Good-looking fish there. Yeah, man. Uh, appropriate with our bottom fishing talk today. In fact, though, Trevor is going to help us out, man. He's not going to send us 25, mile, 25 miles off the beach. He's going to make be closer. He's going to make things happen a lot closer, a lot All right. more reachable. Um, Billy, I'm getting ready to go to Trevor. Get it, Gary. Get it. But before I go to Trevor, a reminder, I am coming back to you for Billy's mm-hmm. best takeaway. But you know what? I'm going to give you an option. All right. You can do Billy's best takeaway. I do enjoy that here on what you think is the best nugget that you take from the podcast. However, I've been feeling like I've been dominating the questions lately. All right. So if you have a question, like when we get to the end, I'm going to come to you and see if you have a question, something I haven't asked. Okay. All right. Thinking that you perhaps represent the more beginner audience. (laughs) I feel that. That's true. I mean, it's true. I'm not going to deny it. And we want the beginner voice to be heard. (laughs) So keep that in mind. I get to have a conversation with the elitists. I'm so excited. Thanks, <laughs> Gary, for the opportunity. But right now, <laughs> we're done with you. Right now, we're going to the talent. <laughs> the talent this week, again, is Captain Trevor Smith of Proficiency Charters, ProFish NC, Proficiency Charters out of Wrightsville Beach, talking about nearshore bottom fishing in the summertime. Trevor, are you there? We are right here, brother. Yes, sir. You are there, man. You've been busy, haven't you? We have been steady busy. People want to get out. They're tired of looking at the, you know, wall inside the house. It's the time of year to get out and enjoy the out of doors. Well, man, we have a lot to talk about. I'm excited about this topic. Um, you know, I've noticed that you've incorporated this into your charter package. You know, avoid staying inside where it's hot and crowded. You get people outside and you get them on fish and they can breathe and they can move around and it's gorgeous out there in the ocean. But what I'd like to do is ask you. And this is what I ask every captain before we proceed. My podcast watchers, my podcast listeners, I don't want them to waste their time. So they're tuned in right now, but tell them why they should continue. Why should they listen to what you have to say about nearshore bottom fishing in the summertime? Because I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night. (laughs) And I feel like that qualifies me to introduce you to bottom fishing nearshore. (laughs) That might be the best answer that might be the best answer we've had to that question. You were one of my professors back in the early 2000s at Cape Fear before I moved on to uh, UNC Wilmington. Early, maybe your first year there, I forget. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the wind definitely comes, trickles down from the Gary. But uh, I tell you, you know, I, I fished my whole life, commercial fish through college. Um, worked for marine fisheries for two years doing the lower Cape Fear River Striper Survey and uh, doing the survey on Red Snapper and Grouper back in uh, 99 and 2000 and uh, just fishing's my passion man i went to the beach to fish as a kid not not chase ladies and whatever that's it is who i am so there you go that's probably smart that you chose not to chase ladies you probably made a good decision there for success ratio very disappointed yeah absolutely (laughs) hey man before we get to the main seminar before we get to how far offshore to go We have another feature on the show. It's called the two-question feature. Two questions, and these are typically somewhat non-fish-related, non-fish-related. And so for you, Trevor, my brainstorming session went like this. The name of your boat is? No Bananas. No Bananas. So we have a superstitious, we have a name based in superstition, fish superstition. So my first question for you is based on fish superstition. I'm going to give you three superstitions. You tell me which one is not true which one is not a superstition are you ready go for it number one and wait till i get read all three please number one never rename your boat number two blondes are bad luck number three never whistle while you're fishing wow all right so i know the first one is a fact that is that is not a superstition that's a fact you never rename a boat (laughs) a fact a fact all right that is a fact I mean, some just like bringing bananas, some like you said would be a superstition. I would claim that's a fact. I've had 
one engine pop and one client uh, find out they had an ulcer by excreting blood through a vomit. Because <laughs> both trips, they had hands on. I would say that that would qualify as a fact. So that's me. Um, we, 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 we go with the sailor folklore. Now, the blondes, not sure, brother. I might be out of the loop on that one. Um, probably bla- bad luck. They might be distracting to the mate that's trying to get off the fish to tie the bricks. I'm not sure. And um, the, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, the latter, I'm not sure of either. I, I'm, uh, maybe I'm a greenhorn. My 18th year as a guide on the water. I don't know. I don't know the latter two there, brother. I'm not, I'm not well versed in superstition either. I went to Google and Google had it as never rename your boat. They said never whistle while fishing. And they actually said redheads are bad luck. They just said nothing about blondes being bad luck. <laughs> That's the sun, the UV, man. Those Irish ladies, they burn quick. That is, you got to go home sooner. I get it for <laughs> sure. So, Trevor, let's transition out of this feature, this superstition feature. Let's go to nearshore bottom fishing. And yeah. the first talking point, how far do I need to go offshore? When we're talking nearshore, when Trevor Smith is talking nearshore, what are we talking? We talk. We- Target species, what do we want to do? Do we want to have more time on the water, less time traveling, and still get on a good amount of fish? Um, most of my clients answer yes. Less time traveling, more fish. Um, in the summer, believe it or not, some of the cooler water is pushed within the first five miles of the beach. Past five starts to jump exponentially as you go out. So let's say we have 83 and a half degree water like we do today. Uh, in the three mile range and you go out seven miles and you have 88 um that affects the fishing fish like cooler water so you can get on you know just as quality fish near shore right now and within three miles as you can 15. so so on a so on a typical summer charter is that your sweet spot is like within five miles three miles um I've, i've heard you say 10 miles before but i don't know in what context that conversation was if we're not going more than 16 miles, we need to stay within three. Um, the shrimp are within three right now. They're everywhere on the bottom, pulls in all the fish, all the grunts, a lot of grunts, a lot of sea bass right now. Um, we're even getting jolthead porgies and trigger fish this week. We got trigger fish at two and a half miles, got on a nice school of them. So it will surprise you how many quality fish are right on the beach, um, you know, within 52 feet of water. So. All right, so I'm excited about the next topic when you sent it through when we were talking about talking points. So um, I want to hear you talk about contour lines versus ARs. So we've talked about how far to go out, but of course Mm -hmm. we need some guidance about what type of bottom to target. So please help me out, help the listeners, the the watchers out. What are we looking for? Absolutely. All right, so I'm going to kind of put it in layman's terms. When we take a trip, we travel, we hop in our car, and we get on the road right? The road takes us to where we want to go. Uh, Very similar for a fish. A contour line is the fish's road for travel. So when you fish the contours, one foot of relief, two foot of relief, three feet of relief, even a half a foot of relief. This is where your hard bottom is kind of holding right on the inside. This is where a lot of bait fish will be. And this is where fish can travel. So when I pull my screen up, Let's say there's 50 people, 50 boats at Liberty Ship, which there is on every given Tuesday, 200 on a Saturday. Um, Back off a half mile. Look at your chart. Find the contour lines. These fish aren't getting to the Liberty Ship because they're just flying across Sandy Bottom. They're following a road as we do when we travel. So don't, you know, don't deviate from that. If you see bait, if you see any kind of activity or any little relief on the bottom while you're following your chart plotter, that is where you need to stop, drop, and see what's going on because that's they're moving. They're moving through there. So So a contour line basically is showing me somewhere where there's a depression, somewhere where the depth changes? Correct. It's almost, if you think of it as, um, as a road, they're continuous. It's like a maze. Contour lines don't go and stop. Contour lines continue. These fish absolutely migrate on these contours. And so that's where, when we're, let's say we're traveling out from the inlet to an AR or to an area where we have interest in a rock, rock pile, natural relief, we'll deviate a half mile north or south and follow the contour out. Yeah, it takes a little longer, but you have options on the way out to slow down and check out the relief. 
these are the ways the fish are getting moving through the ocean so if you will unless you're a leatherback or a file fish you know you're not traveling on sandy bottom you're following the road so that's my theory and so are we basically looking for just about any contour line might be able to produce or like a contour line that comes close to something like the Liberty ship or something close to a, another AR. I mean, there's gotta be some no. contour lines that are tend to be more productive than others or no. When, um, my advice to folks is I'm, it's your, it's your map. It's there for you. When you troll or you want to go out, follow your Navionics chip, and follow those lines. Find bottom that goes from contour line to rubble to limestone to contour to little frond. You might find a patch that's a half acre or less that's all yours. That's all we fish now, are, are areas we find along contours. It's They hold fish. They're not pressured. Um, they're easy to find if you just put a day into it. And look, they're not going to be on a map. They're not. Uh, it's natural relief that you have to kind of find on your own, but it's easy to find if you put your mind to it. And then, so I've been struck. I've been following the contour line maybe a little bit too closely. So help me out again. I'm following that contour line. What is it that I'm going to see that's going to make me say, "All right, let's try this spot on this contour line." Sure. So let's think of an EKG. All right, you're following a contour line. It looks pretty smooth. Maybe sand is filled in. The little relief that's there. All of a sudden, the sand is washed out. Whether it's a current, whether it's just naturally washed out, it stays washed out. Hard bottom. Maybe something took hold. A coral. A frond. Um, even sargazzo, we have sargazzo that is, that's starting to grow on contours that, that holds breeder fish. You look for something different. You don't look for the smooth. You're traveling down the contour. You see the smooth. You see the gentle slope. Don't look for that. Look for the EKG. When all of a sudden it switches to this, and it doesn't have to be much, even two feet of this, for let's say 15 yards or 20 yards, it's worth stopping. It's worth dropping down on. You're going to see relief. You're going to see marks on it. You're going to mark air bladders on your sounder. Um, fish it see what happens you know give it 20 minutes fish so what, keep moving through i tell my clients when we fish these areas you'll catch sea bass for 15 minutes you'll catch grunts for 10 minutes then you'll get you know ringtails will push through and then you'll get some jolt heads and then let's say the uh banded rudder fish move through they come in waves they're that's what leads me to say they're traveling because they come in waves when you fish these reliefs on the contours and these EKG, these EKG marks, are they caused by the bottom? Are they caused by the fish that are cruising along the contour lines? Are they caused by the air bladders? Like, help me out just a little bit more because I think this is key to success. The absence of the sand fill. So when sand fills in, let's say from a storm or from a strong current, fills in the contour, it covers up the relief. The relief is covered up. The fish are going to keep moving down the contour, but they're not going to stop to feed. They stop to feed where there is limestone, fronds, um, any kind of coral that decides to take hold and or any kind of live bottom um, materials such as sargasso, which we do have a lot of between 14 and 18 miles and get a lot of fish that just like to hang out in it and breed and I guess their eggs attach and whatnot. So um, these are important areas to, to look at and look for. So traveling a contour, you find an area that looks bumpy, EKG like you can see the bottom through your bottom machine if it's relatively new. You can read hard bottom and soft bottom. You can read uh, bottom growth. That's where you stop. That's where you just sample it. You know, the littlest, the li the smallest half acre can produce for you more bottom fish within five miles than any stop on a uh, man-made reef or wreck. So, okay, man, I follow. So let's go. Let's go over to the uh, the jigs, the hooks, and then we'll go to sure. bait options. But talk to me about terminal tackle for a little bit. Absolutely, man. Uh, I'm all light tackle inside of five. So I'm using 30 pound, 30 pound braid, uh, medium light to medium heavy um, rods, depending on what's around. Uh, with 4000 series spinning reels, garden variety, take your pick. I'm not sponsored. And I'm not looking for sponsors. Just whatever you are confident in. Um, Yozuri fluorocarbon, 30 pound all the time. Uni knot um, with a jig head. For my, my folks that like to jig, um, half ounce is usually the minimum I use when I'm out there. Uh, the other way we fish is a high-low rig. We'll tie 30 pound with a high-low. We'll come off of the swivel with a tag on our uh, polymer knot. And then you have your hook off the polymer knot. And then you have a dropper loop and just put your weight on. 
and or a Carolina rig if you're drift fishing. Let's say you're not under anchor, uh, flounder around on the near shore reefs. You have squid strips, you have mullet. Uh, you need a uh, you need a Carolina rig, half ounce weight to three quarter ounce weight, depending on your your speed of drift. Um, circle hook, three yacht, and a and a. I, I prefer the squid strips, man. So. All right, so let me go. Let me back up a little bit. So I kind of gave it a shotgun. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, you did it. Now I can follow up. I mean, I, I got my notes here to help me out. So first type is just a jig head rig. I mean, we're talking about what I'm used to fishing inshore, like just a jig head with a soft plastic on it. Absolutely. And a fat one, a beefy one with a beefy hook. Um, a lot of them are sold as generic for like a buck. They're throwaways. There's a lot of throwaways with crappy paint, whatever. They're fine for near shore bottom mounts. And you're going to buy the five pound box of squid strips. I get mine at Intercoastal Angler. Um, Texas has them here in town, um, and I'm sure some other tackle shops do as well. I cut them in three-inch strips, cut them in, you know, three-inch strips so they're, they're nice and wavy, and just bounce them on the bottom. Forget about a, a soft plastic. Forget about all that. For 19 bucks, you can get a giant box of squid strips. Um, buy the chicken scissors, the blue handle for three bucks. Cut them, cut them to form, and, man, you're ready to go. All right, and now I think I was writing down, so I might have missed the description of the second one. Did you call it a high-low rig? Is that what you had? Was it a basic two-hook sure. rig? Old-school two-hooker, man. Uh, start with a swivel, tie it to your main line, and then I use 30-pound fluoro, um, and, I'll, and I'll polymer knot. Um, and on the short tag end, I'll put my circle hook, 3 aught to 4 aught, And on the one-and-a-half-foot dropper, I'll just tie a loop loop knot and put a two to three ounce bank sinker or, or dropper sinker on there. And that's just if we're fishing straight up and down on a reef. You know, we're anchored up, dropping down, hit bottom, one crank up, your bait's suspended two and a half feet off the bottom, coming off your main line. Um, that's how we like to fish our near shore structure. So. And then a Carolina rig is just what I'm, you know, our standard Carolina rig, you Love know, it. what, 30 pound liter or you go heavier out there? Go heavier if you like. Let's say there's cobia in the area. You know, we'll go heavier to the larger reels with 60-pound braid and and 40-pound to 50-pound uh, fluoro. But, yeah, just 30-pound fluoro, half-ounce egg weight um, with your circle hook. And those are our drift rigs. Let's say you want to drift. You want to cover some ground. You found your live bottom. You found your contour line. You have your set and drift. Your set and drift lines you up down that contour. Drift it. Make some passes. I mean, that's really how you can explore an area. Um, you don't just always want to post up and just try to drop the drop the pin on the trash can lid every time. You want to kind of survey the area. You know, a, a big doormat flounder, for instance, is not going to compete with a sea bass sitting right on the good hard structure. They're going to be right on the outside of it, maybe 20, 30 yards. That drift will put you right in play for that other fish as well. So, you know, that's something, you know, a good way to, to source the area and really find out what's what's below you. All right, jigs and hooks, and then we said bait options. You mentioned squid. Are you putting, Man, any, are you putting anything else on the boat? I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not, and here's why. Uh, we had a cigar minnow shortage recently, you know, last year and year before. Um, the Spanish sardine game changed. They started flash freezing those beautifully single individuals, so they're not a chunk of mashed potatoes. But what came about, was the squid strip game came around the Humboldt squid, the California squid, the Japanese Humboldts, California Humboldts. They're taking these wings on the pack coast, slicing them beautifully, one inch by eight inch strips. Um, and you can actually troll them on Hank Brown's now. That was kind of a uh, backup for the cigar minnow shortage. But what we have now is a great option for bottom fishing. You no longer have to buy the little mushy packs of whole tiny squids. You get hardy strips, five pounds for 20 bucks. Man, it'll last you forever, and they're they're brilliant. I, I can't think of a better bait out there. Even with our cobia jigs, there's a little secret. Um, we stopped throwing uh, curly tails on there. We straight up get the big jig heads. When a cobia comes around, we reach back to our squid box, put an 8-inch squid strip on there. Man, every time they eat it. Every time. So, yes, sir. And on the, uh, and I, again, I think on the high-low rig, you're chunking, or are you stripping on that, too? Oh, yeah. So we're postage stamp. That's what I call it. Postage stamp. Get the chicken scissors right by the client, cut up a big pile. If they don't want to touch it, whatever we put them on an elephant will eat a peanut, right? We got a cobia last week on a postage stamp. I mean, it wasn't a huge cobia. It was like a 33 incher. Um, it was a netter, but 
paid a postage stamp. An elephant eats a peanut out there. So. All right. So now I'm going to push you to impl- implementation. I mean, we've got our gear. We've talked about how far. We've talked about what to look for. We got our gear. We got our bait. We got our rigs. And you've already you've already hit some highlights, but I just want to make sure we're being thorough and going through. Um, what's your decision process about anchoring versus drifting? Both. I like both. I think I think it's important when you get to an area to find your set and drift and drift it first. That way, you know, if there's anything on the outside, let's say maybe there's flatties laying summer flounder laying around the outside. We're in flounder season. You won't find that out if you're just straight dropping on the hard structure. You're going to find it on the outside. Um, you know, just both. I would drift two or three drifts and then get on your main numbers that you like that you mark fish on. By that point in time, you already have your set and drift for your anchor and or if you're lucky enough or fortunate enough to have a spot lock, you just tether up to the satellite. But um, it gives you some opportunities to see what's on the bottom. You need to know what's around you before you just go Leroy Jenkins into it, you know. So so, so I want to drift first once I see some action or see better stuff on the machine, you know, get some bites, make note of that, and then come back and anchor up and really start to hammer those areas. Um, when you're anchored up and you're catching fish, how long do you stay, man? How do you know that it's time to move on and drift some more or hit a, hit a new spot? Sure, absolutely. So um, occasionally, and, and it's it's kind of funny you ask that question. I, I've had to, uh, you know, sometimes encourage myself to stay for a little longer. Um, you have to work fish up. You got you have to start fishing. You see fish down there. Fish will will slow off their bite at certain times, certain moon phases when the tide goes slack. Even out there, two, three, four miles in the ocean, the bite's going to stop. Um, that's when I travel, you know, so if, let's say you're fishing bites on tide slows down tide stops You have another place you'd like to go. You need a you need a boogie right then get moving while the tide slack You know save your good fishing time and then start fishing again um, As far as when do you move? Don't get discouraged if in the first minute or two you don't get a fish um, You have to pull fish up. You have to I call it working fish You have to pull fish up to make fish come when you're, when you're pulling these fish up through two, three atmospheres of water, they're voiding their stomachs. So essentially what you're doing is chumming the live bottom you're on. So the more fish you pull up, don't get discouraged pulling up ringtails and little sea bass. The bigger fish are going to show up. And I give it no more than 30 minutes. If you've been waylaying these little fish, they've been voiding their stomachs coming up. You're sending them back down. They're chumming your live bottom for you. Um, there's no big fish in 30 minutes. Get out of there. You know, go find some other ground. But typically they'll show up. So. Well, what about tide, man? Are you saying that when they're on a slack tide, it tends to slow down, or we can't even call it that concretely? Uh, that's that's a very accurate statement. Uh, when the when the, when there's a slack tide, or the moon is you know, completely on the other, other side of the Earth, and the current just freaking crawls like a snail, that's when you need to uh, when you need to travel. And typically, thirty to forty minutes, you're you're going to have a dead tide every day. And you need to come up with a game plan. A lot of times, that's when we drift. We wind drift. It keeps the bait moving across the bottom, mimicking a tide that's not there, um, if you have any wind. Um, but that's really the way to get them to feed at the tide transition, is to pull anchor and drift or travel to your next location. And then what about like any other variables? Uh, I mean, I'm thinking if, it's there, if there's too much current then you're or tide, then you're not drifting. Is that a time to anchor up or... Or how do you play that game? Good question. Um, there's been days where I've just been blown away by a, almost a three-mile-an-hour drift. Just hauling booty. Um, these fish love it. You up your sinker size to where you can still bump bottom at least every three or four feet with a fast drift. And you, you'll be very surprised on how many big fish want to go in pursuit of your bait rather than just have it presented to them. So give it a shot. You know, if you, want, if you have an ounce-and-a-half sinker and drop it on down, of course, you beef up. I beef up on the fast drift. We do get snagged more um, when you're when you're really hauling booty with a bigger bigger egg weight. It tends to wedge a little more. So I do up it a little bit. You know, maybe 40, 50 pound braid and, and 40 pound you know leader there. But um, try it. You know, if the if the, if the tide's going too fast, you know, I, a lot of times we'll flutter jig. We'll put bigger jigs on. We'll anchor and just try to get the jig to the bottom and going. But uh, a fast tide is not a bad tide. It's a great time to fish. You just have to figure out what works for you all right now we have a good drift going you know good drift speed and 
you know, one guy's got a jig head, the other guy's got a high low, the other guy's got a Carolina rig. Those three rigs, am I am I instructed on your boat to do any action? Am I just dragging them on? Am I lifting, dropping, lifting, dropping? Like, what? How do you coach people on your boat, or just let it drag smoothly across the bottom? Sure, that's a really good question. So, first thing I tell my clients is always hold the rod above the reel because a shark, a reef, Mother Earth. It's going to rip the rod out of your hand. Hold it above the reel. We always adjust the drag so that it allows some pull so it's not a surprise. You know, we don't lock these things down like 40 pounds of grouper drag. We have them, you know, at two, three, four pounds max. So you're dragging only Carolina rigs. And we do bounce. Uh, we do bounce jig heads for, for flatties on the drift. Not really, um, not really when it's going too fast with the jig head. Usually that's just Carolina rig. Jig head tends to, to uh, pay up in the water column a little, a little quicker than a Carolina rig would. Um, the high low man for me, that is straight stationary fishing. Um, I don't, I don't like to pull high lows just by the nature of the, the shape sinkers we're, we're using for those rigs. So. And I'm a yeah. You told me about the high low. I forgot that you said that was an anchor only. But if I'm drifting that Carolina rig, am I trying to set the hook when I feel anything, or am I waiting until I feel something a little bit more substantial? You're just you're just waiting for that thing to hang, man. There's no there's. I tell my, my folks to hold it at an angle. You don't want to point at the drift. You want to hold it at about a thirty degree to the drift, so that when you get that that hang that hangs, you're going to be your fish, hopefully, and not Mother Earth. That you have some play in your rod because your rod is what wins the battle, not the reel. So we always want to be sure the rod is what's in play when the fish hits or the ground hits. If the ground hits. I always tell them if it's pulling too hard, right when we feel it's hooked up, point it at the snag, and that saves your rod. So you, there is a there's a little dance there. There's a learning curve. So, all right, now what I think, um, just in talking to you, what I think I'd like to do is maybe um, give me sort of a quick review of like maybe the top three, top four summer species that you can target on near shore. You know, just give me some names and that I can put them in a cooler and expect to have some fish tacos, maybe a fish fry when I come home and just a little bit insight on each of your top three or four species. How about that, man? No doubt. Absolutely. So in the summertime, it's hot. It's, it's really hard to pick up a fish, even on the inside these days. Um, with all the boat traffic, the, the water's so hot. These, these fish haven't, um, they're smart, you know, they're, 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 they're smart. They avoid, avoid traffic areas. So we do get off the beach these days and a lot more people are getting off the beach to, to bottom fish two to three to five miles. So number one species on my, on my chart there is going to be silver snapper, also known as a white grunt. They are a delicious fish. They, um, are more head than meat, but I tell you what, that meat is, the meat is awesome. And it's something, um, it's something that we have in, in a plentiful amount of if you're lucky enough to get a keeper sea bass this time of year, congratulations. You're most not likely going to get one within five miles this time of year. So you need to be thinking about banded rudder fish. Um, they are of the jack species. However, they were a small, small jack, similar to a, a pompano, but maybe a corval type pompano. But they're tiny, um, delicious eating fish. We get those uh, mainly on jigs uh, while we're bottom fishing on the near shore structure this time of year. That is absolutely a number one or two as well. And then, of course, when uh, flounder comes, that's going to be uh, that's going to be our next up on the list there. So, um, yep, man, I like it. I like it a lot. So, so we've we've covered the main points. I mean, I like what we've done, and I I guess this is the time in the show where I just circle back around, and because I I know that you had some thoughts coming in. You know, we had some talking points, and I don't know that I've set you up to share everything you you wanted to. So we're just going to hit them one more time and just see if there's anything else to add that hasn't been said. How far how far offshore to go? Any other any final thoughts on how far offshore to go? Stay inside of four miles this time of year. Stay inside. You have cooler water on the beach. There's more fish on the bottom. There's shrimp on the bottom. Do something different. Find your contour lines. Drift them, find little hard bottom reliefs, get your own little reef and name it, you know, Billy's house. That's where you're going to get fish this time of year. And then when will you start going, when in the calendar will you start advising to go further than four miles off? 100%. When that water drops below 84 degrees, um, venture out five, six miles. Right now, I mean, we're getting in 84 degrees at the 10, 12 mile area, not 84 degrees inside of it. Um, the water is just too plain hot. So when that water drops out, 
Um, you know, 78, it's game on all the way out to the 23. So right now we're, we're, we're pushed on the beach. The big kings are on the beach. The shrimp's on the beach. The bait's on the beach. The, you know, gray trout are on the beach on the near shore stuff. That's fun, even though you only keep one. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of options close. Don't go too far. You'll be disappointed. All right. Next topic. Final thoughts, Trevor Smith. Final thoughts on contour lines versus ARs. Sure. Um, ARs are overfished, way overfished. Let's just talk about the contour lines leading out from the schoolhouse. Think about all the ledges following the contours past the schoolhouse to go all the way out. Way more fish on those guys. Um, around any kind of any kind of area, the five mile boxcars. Holy cow, half mile to the south, there's a contour line you can follow for a mile and a half and just wear fish out. People don't know that. You need to go find the areas that the fish travel. Um, again, fish aren't just gliding across the sandy bottom. Fish are following hard bottom structure, contours, currents, rips on the bottom, no matter if they're six inches or six feet. That's where their food is. That's where they're traveling. So fish them. Hey, uh, Billy just handed me a question. His mic, he's wondering about it. Billy's question is contour lines primarily going east, west, north, south. Oh, man, they're going from <laughs> – so they're, they're kind of funny off our beach. They're almost striation lines. So you have to look at the old maps and see where they go. A lot of them go south kind of to a little bit north. They kind of follow a little south-north pattern. Um, you need to think about that when you come off. It's almost like brushing a brush stroke up, and you'll see them on your map. You'll see them on your map. And you okay. know when a contour meets a sea or a contour meets – let's say you see circle and a circle and a circle – that means there's a little archipelago there. So you need to search that area and those contours to see if there's, you know, any any sargazzo grass, any live bottom, anything like that. That's kind of, I think, a deadliest catch. You know, what do they do? They drop the pots on the contours. They have names for them. Mr. Magoo, all this stuff. The contours are where fish travel. Right on. Final yep. thoughts on jigs, hooks, bait options. Yeah, man. Final thoughts. Uh, get jiggy with it. When you're jigging, let the jig hit the bottom. <laughs> I don't even do one crank up. Hit the bottom, hold it like it's an extension of your arm above the reel. Jig, you want every little pop to be a hook set every single time. If you miss them on that first one, it's over. You just Every jig's a nice steady pop with your forearm. Always pop the bottom. Um, you know, as far as bait goes, again, this time of year, guys, squid strip, squid strip, squid strip. I love it. It's easy. It's cheap. Lasts you a long time, and they can't resist it. Even if a cobia swims up, bigger jig head, bigger deal. Eight-inch strip of squid. It looks like an eel flying through the water. They they just crush them. I mean, there's not even. It takes it takes the. Uh, it's like when Berkeley came out with a gulp years ago. Even a blind, you know, child, little tiny, non-experienced anybody could catch a fish in a uh, in a mud puddle. So, man, Trevor, thank you so much. This has been a great talk. I mean, I think we've covered a lot of ground here. Um, before Absolutely. we before we say goodbye, though, what I'd like for you to do is. Um, you are more proficiency charters, Captain Trevor Smith out of Wrightsville Beach. You are more than near shore bottom fishing in the summertime. How about the quick highlight reel about what you're targeting in the spring, summer, and fall? Quick highlight uh, reel. For sure. So quick highlight reel, uh, I really take pride in taking families and kids out fishing, getting them on their first, their second, third, fourth experience, just enjoying it with them. Um, I, I go for more action, more fun than just – you know, I'm not your guy to go out and say, let's fill a cooler. We'll go fill a cooler, but I'm more about having fun and getting you in the game and just doing it safe. And uh, we fish for everything. Uh, inshore, inshore trout, you know, nearshore Taltog, offshore kings, offshore mahi, um, you know, you kind of name it. We, we do not go to the Gulf Stream. It's not in our business model. Uh, we pretty much stay within 27 miles um, and just cater to families and, 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 and hardcore fishermen and and folks that have never fished before, which is the majority of my clients. So, Right on, man. Trevor, appreciate the relationship. Appreciate your time today talking to us about nearshore bottom fishing. Looking He's forward welcome. to the next podcast. Looking forward to our next fishing trip together, man. Absolutely, Gary. All right. Good. Have a good summer. Have a good one. Billy. What a show, Gary. What a show. That's yeah. good stuff, man. I told you, man. Trevor's got good energy. He's got good analogies. Yeah. Yeah, really Got good information. Get jiggy with it, man. Get jiggy with it. I like it. <laughs> oh man, well, sorry I couldn't ask my question there toward the end. My I had a little trouble with my microphone, so thanks for covering for me, Gary. Yeah, man. Yeah, absolutely. But I do like the contour lines, man. I've never heard. Is that your best that. takeaway? Yeah, I mean that's a good takeaway. It's like fish highways. You know, I always often wonder that. I'm like, 
man, how do these guys find fish out here? But that makes sense. It's clever. I yeah. mean, it's really clever. Yeah, it's good good it's, stuff, man. It's more clever than saying, I'm not even looking for sponsorships. <laughs> <laughs> when he was talking about rod and reels, I'm not sponsored. I'm not, I'm not even I'm looking, not for looking for sponsorships. For man, we had this surprise <laughs> prepared for him. Dan Vanette of Penn Fishing was going to outfit the boat. But since he's not looking, but he's not looking, we'll wait till the next podcast. Yeah, man, absolutely. <laughs> Oh, speaking of the next podcast, if you want to watch or listen, if you are watching and you haven't listened or vice versa, you can check us out on Spotify, Podbean, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and Google. Um, and also the best way, Gary, once again, is for people to go to our website, fishermanspost.com, and go to our podcast section, and they can check out all the links there. Um, man, just having a lot of fun, a lot of fun with this podcast. And and we're thankful, speaking of sponsors, for Marine Warehouse Center been an awesome sponsor and look for more sponsors to come on board as we continue to grow the podcast so yeah man it's been a good journey i love talking to our friend you know we're talking to our friends they're sharing all kinds yeah, of information good. i feel good about you know them trying to help out everyone again we seek out the i believe we seek out the right captains not just that are smart but are good communicators and want to share yeah. I, I, I pride myself on that you've done a good great job gary great i job have done a, i mean really and if I can just keep you looking any, pretty. Any of Trevor's team. success is my success. I'm, I'm just going to usurp his success and make it Especially mine. from this point on, right? Right? <laughs> hey, everyone. Send oh, us man. your fish photos. Send us your fish videos. Videos of no more than one minute, please. And thank you, as always, for tuning in. Looking forward to next time already. Absolutely, man. We'll see you next week, Gary.